Thank you very, very much for making the effort to come out and be here tonight. You will be very uh, well fed tonight, and you'll be very glad that you came. For that, we appreciate that. Uh, we'd like to open tonight with a word of prayer. I'd like to ask uh, Jason Morgan if you would give us an opening prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are met here because of our love for Thee and for the great blessings Thou hast provided in creating and blessing this land in which we live. <clears throat> we feel to love Thee and serve Thee. We feel to arm ourselves with information and opportunities to do our part in this day to give our lives to a good cause to save this land from the attacks that surely are based in the adversary <clears throat> who is attacking thy good works. May we show ourselves worthy of thy approval and blessing by being willing to do our part to combat evil and to restore peace and righteousness to this land. We thank thee for thy blessings. We thank thee that we live in this great land. We know that it is by thy hand and, and blessing that we have this great land. We praise thy name. Please be with us and help our hearts to be moved where they need. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Um, Folks, we are really, really going to be blessed with a great speaker this evening. And um, I don't want to embarrass him too much because we've known him for a long time, but he's one of our very favorite people in the whole world because he understands the principles of freedom and liberty. And um, if, if I can beg some of Rick's um, approbation here, I guess, I'm going to just tell you something really quick. Uh, this is kind of about myself. And I felt like maybe I'd like to share this with you. Uh, I'm a convert to the church, as most of you probably know. I joined the church, I think, when I was about 20 or 21, something like that. I can't remember, 61, some long time ago. Anyway, uh, the reason that the gospel found me, or I found the gospel, has to do with the fact that as a young girl, when I was being raised back in Illinois, Champaign, Illinois, um, my parents were very patriotic people. Uh, they were what we used to call red-hot Robert Taft Republicans. Now, some of you will know that, and some of you won't. But anyway, um, they weren't precinct committeemen, they weren't involved in any party politics, but they always voted, and they always knew what was going on. Back in those days, families really did. And so I heard a lot of talk around the table, and Every year, whenever they had parades back in our town, which was often, we had parades the 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Columbus Day, <coughs> we would always go to these parades. And as I would stand there on that curbing, as a young girl, I can remember back being seven, eight years old, when the flag went by with the marching band, something inside here really, really touched me, and it was very difficult to hold back the tears. I didn't understand that at all back then, but I knew it was an emotion that had a meaning. Well, later on, as I grew up and when I got into high school, sometimes we'd have assemblies that were patriotic assemblies, or sometimes we'd just have an assembly where we'd sing the Star Spangled Banner or America the Beautiful. And again, here's that feeling that was so strong, and I'd have to fight to not tear up because I didn't want to be embarrassed in front of my friends, but that was there. Well, a few years later, when I lived in Tucson, I went to hear a man and his son speak. They were speaking about the principles of freedom and liberty, and that was Ezra Tapp Benson and his son Reed Benson. And as I sat there in that audience and I heard that man speak, 
my heart, my bosom burned so much with inside of me, I could hardly control myself. And just a little bit later, a few months later, when the LDS missionaries came to teach me about the gospel of Jesus Christ, I immediately had the same feeling. And so for me, Karen Johnson, the principles of freedom and liberty and the Constitution are like this. There's no separation in my mind. And that is one of the reasons why my life has been, I guess, the way it has been, because I love the gospel with all my heart, and I love this country with all my heart, and I will do anything that it takes to preserve and protect this land and to help the leaders, our legislators, the people that serve to understand what the proper role of government is and what the rule of law is. And that is sadly lacking today in our elected officials. At any rate, Rick is going to pick up from here and he is going to run you a race here tonight with the information that he has. So you will be well fed. Thank you again for being here. The title of this presentation is The Book of Mormon, The Constitution, and You. And uh, there really is a relationship between all three. I certainly hope you realize it as I do. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, important principles. We're going to talk about duties of a citizen. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about myself. I am not a spokesman for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, I am not a spokesman for Heritage Academy, which is the school where I teach. I'm not a spokesman for anybody else but myself. However, for the next 35 minutes, virtually every word I speak will be the words of the scriptures and the prophets, verbatim. I'm not a spokesman for them, but they certainly are a spokesman for themselves. Um, if I happen to interpret a thing or two, uh, then that's my own interpretation. But I, much of the, of the, of the promptings and the, and the commandments and the warnings of the prophets is very clear and uh, not really ambiguous about our situation with freedom and liberty and the mission of the church and the gospel. So let's begin by going way back way back before any of us came to earth. And I don't know how far back in earth time that was, but there was a great council and a war in heaven. And in that, uh, during that war, there was counsel given, there were proposals made, as I assume you know. We go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Now there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against him. Uh, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, <clears throat> which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. Now we're going to go to the Eternal Great Price, the book of Moses, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And I, the Lord, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan, whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten, is the same which was from the beginning. And he came before me, saying, Behold, here am I, send me. I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that, that one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Therefore give me thine honor. Second verse, Behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me, and sought to destroy the agency of man which I, the Lord, had given unto him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power. By the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down. That's the quote from President Benson uh, at the Assembly Hall in 1966. And I quote, 
Every person on the earth chose the right side during the war in heaven. Be on the right side now. President David O. McKay at BYU, May 18, 1960. There are two contending forces. These forces are known and have been designated by different terms throughout the ages. In the beginning, they were known as Satan on the one hand and Christ on the other. In these days, they are called domination by the state on one hand, personal liberty on the other. By the way, let me give credit. This presentation was put together by a wonderful patriot and freedom fighter, Brian Turner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's his. I'm using his. It saved me the time to put something together myself. Next quote is President John Taylor. In general, and by the way, notice these are general conference talks. These are, these are in conference from the pulpit. General Conference, April 1882, John Taylor. Besides the God preaching the gospel, we have another mission. The perpetuation of the free agency of man and the maintenance of liberty, freedom, and the rights of man. The Ensign, February 2006. The title of the article is, I, the Lord, Make You Free. And this is, uh, boy, it's kind of small, Elder Shirley Christensen. Our responsibility to preserve freedoms. Are we doing all that we should, should to preserve freedom wherever we live? The Lord has placed upon his children the responsibility of preserving their precious freedoms. President Ezra Taft Benson, in a little book he wrote called The Proper Role of Government. There are only two possible sources. Rights are either God-given as part of the divine plan, or they are granted by government as part of the political plan. If we accept the premise that human rights are granted by government, then we must be willing to accept the corollary that they can be, be, be denied by government. I, for one, shall never accept that premise. Doctrine and Covenants, section 134, verses 1 and 2. We believe that governments are instituted of God for the benefit of man, and that he holds men accountable for their actions in relation to them, both in making laws and in administering them for the good and safety of society. We believe that no government can exist in peace except such laws are framed and held inviolate, as will secure each individual the free exercise of conscience, the right and control of property, and the protection of life. DNC 101, verses 77 and 78. According to the laws and constitution of the people which I have suffered to be established, and should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh, according to just and holy principles, that every man may act in doctrine and principle pertaining to futurity, according to the moral agency which I have given unto him, that every man may be accountable for his sins, for his own sins in the day of judgment. I'm going to editorialize here. The way, we, the way we work to maintain our rights has to do with not only our freedoms in government from, uh, and, and liberties, but our salvation. DNC 98, verses 6 and 7. Therefore I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law which is the constitutional law of the land. The adjective in there. Constitutional law. He didn't say the law of the land. Yeah. And as pertaining to the law of man, whatsoever is more or less than this, than this cometh from evil. If it's not constitutional law, if it's more or less, it's evil. Freedom is so important that God sent Moroni to ensure victory. This is something that a good number of the saints that I, that I speak with had not heard before. Elder Orson Hyde, in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, page 368. That same angel that appeared to Joseph Smith was in the camp of Washington. By an invisible hand led on our fathers to conquest and victory. That's how important it was. Every one of those, uh, Wilford Woodruff, General Conference, April 1898. Every one of those men that signed the Declaration of Independence called upon me as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Would those spirits have called upon me as an elder in Israel to perform that work if they had not been noble spirits before God? They would not. Joseph F. Smith, General Conference, April 1946. <clears throat> There has been a tendency among some Latter-day Saints, even when the Constitution is mentioned, to say, there he goes talking politics. I am not talking politics. I am quoting the words of the Lord. That's Joseph F. Smith. 
President George Albert Smith, General Conference, April 1948. The Constitution is as much from God as the Ten Commandments. Nothing ambiguous about that. <clears throat> President McKay, President Benson, and Elder L. Tom Perry all have said the following at various times. On the slide, the details and the dates are there. This is President McKay's. Uh, how I remember as a young child, about eight years old, I remember after conference, waiting right outside the little tunnel entrance where we knew the, the uh, general authorities came and went between conference sessions. Saw that black limousine come out. We were there just to get a glimpse. And all of a sudden, right in front of us, that big old limo stopped. And the white-haired prophet stepped out and at us. Well, I could see and feel the Spirit of God. And he shook. He shook everyone's hand. Everybody that was there until the last one had had a chance to touch his hand. Anyway, listen to his statement. Next to being one and worshiping Jesus Christ, or God, there is nothing in this world upon which this church should be more united than in upholding and defending the Constitution of the United States. Pretty powerful. So why it is important? Why is it important for church members to participate in the political process? Well, let's let's do <coughs> J. Reuben Clark, member of the first presidency with David O. McKay. I say this is uh, this is J. Reuben Clark, General Conference, April 1944. I say unto you with all the soberness that I can that we stand in danger of losing our liberties, and that once lost. Only blood will bring them back. And once lost, if we of this church will, in order to keep the church going forward, we will have more sacrifices to make and more persecutions to endure than we have yet known. Heavy as our sacrifices and grievous as our persecutions of the past have been. That should wake us up. President Benson Concerning the United States, this is General Conference, October 1961. Concerning the United States, the Lord revealed to his prophets that its greatest threat would be a vast, worldwide, secret combination, which would not only threaten the United States, but also seek to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. Secret society, secret organization, conspiracy is another word. That's what it is. Secret combination. Absolutely. Well, you know what a secret combination Right out of the Book of Mormon. That language is right out of the Book of Mormon. Secret combination. Rick, uh, Whitaker Chambers, who was a communist for many years, also called it a combination. Yeah. He was an underground communist, and he, and he was describing them setting up another combination, okay. separate from the one he was in. In other words, they are, they are a combination. They're very intricate, and they take oaths and covenants, and one... Line doesn't know what the other line's doing. Yep, oh, absolutely. That's oh. Absolutely. J. Reuben Clark. Clark. This is continuing his statements. This is all in General Conference 1972. He wasn't. No. No. President Benson. Oh, yeah. Continuing President Benson. The, the downfall of two great American civilizations came as a result of secret conspiracies. Listen to this. There is no conspiracy theory in the Book of Mormon. It is a conspiracy fact, the problem, ladies and gentlemen. Who said that? President Benson. And then there's a, a book, this book, none dare call it conspiracy, shows on the screen, which he recommended, which we'll get to. President Benson continuing, 1988 General Conference, October. A secret combination that seeks to overthrow the freedom of all lands, <clears throat> nations, and countries is increasing its evil influence over America and the entire world. Fellow Joseph B. Worthlin. General Conference, October 1995. The Lord has warned repeatedly against the evils and designs of conspiring men in our day who would enslave us. The words conspiracy, conspiring. Now we go to the Book of Ether, in the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> chapter 8, verses 20 through 25. And now I, Moroni, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations, for it has been made known unto me that they are had among all people, and that they are had among the Lamanites. And they have caused the destruction of this people of whom I am now speaking. 
and also the destruction of the people of Nephi. And whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints, which shall be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground for vengeance upon them, and yet he avenged them not. Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be so known unto you, shown unto you, that thereby you may repent of your sins, and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you. You're built up to get power and gain, and the work, yea, even the work of destruction, come upon you. Yea, even the sword of justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction, if ye shall suffer these things to be. Wherefore the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation, because of this secret combination which shall be among you, or woe be unto it, because of the blood of them who have been slain, for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it, and also upon those who build it up. This is the last verse of that group, this is 25. For it cometh to pass that whoso buildeth up seeketh to overthrow, whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all nations, lands, and countries. And it bringeth to pass the, destru pass the destruction of all people. For it is built up by the devil, who is the father of all lies, even that same liar who beguiled our first parents, <clears throat> even that same liar who hath caused man to commit murder from the beginning, who hath hardened the hearts of men, that they have murdered the prophets and stoned them and cast them out from the beginning. Okay, the scriptures, now this is not anybody's quote, we're just going to review some stuff. In these last five verses we just read. The scriptures describe this latter-day conspiracy that seeks to destroy the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. These verses, chapters, especially verses 23 through 25, teach us this conspiracy seeks to first get power, second, to get or gain money, third, that it will murder, fourth, that it seeks to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries, and that it will bring destruction to all people. Powerful. As was shown before, the Lord's prophets have admonished us to do all we can to preserve freedom. Moroni pleads for the same thing here. He pleads with us to awake to a sense of our awful situation and do three things. We must repent of our sins. We must not allow the conspiracy to get above us. And we must share and warn our neighbors. For if we do let it get above us. It will prove our destruction. And what are the two civilizations President Benson said were destroyed? Nephites and the Jaredites. Nephites and Jaredites. President Benson says, you know, there are, this is General Conference 1965 from President, President Benson. So what do we do? Do we, do we work hard? Do we sit back and let the, wait for the church to give us a program? Do we just live the gospel and build a little cocoon and, and <coughs> stay where we're at? He says, there are certain neutralizers which Satan uses against us to neutralize us and keep us from fighting the fight for freedom. Here they are. One, we can, Satan says, we really haven't received much instruction about freedom. But the prophet says, this is a lie, quoting General uh, President Benson. For we have been warned time and again. Last conference I spoke, this is President Benson's words, last conference I spoke of a book embodying much of the prophet's warning on freedom, from Joseph Smith to David O. McKay, which I commend to you. In general conference, the title is Prophets, Principles, and National Survival. It is a collection of, com of commandments, warnings, and, and prophecies from those who we have sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators, namely the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve, on every political topic you can think of. It could come right out of the front pages today. We have been warned. We have been commanded. We have been educated. And the next neutralizer, well, we're too involved in other church work. I mean, we've got more important things to do in the church right now. We've got this and that and this and that. That's what Satan tells us. The prophet says, quoting President Benton in the same talk, April 1965, but freedom is a weighty matter of the law. It is one of these major important things, he says. 
The lesser principles of the gospel you should keep, but not leave this one undone. We may have to balance and manage our time better. If we're commanded to do all ten things, we, we don't drop one because the other ones take more time. We find a way to obey all the commandments and to take care of all of these responsibilities that the Lord places upon us. And we can do it because He promises we can. The next neutralizer. Well, you want to be loved by everybody, says the devil. And this freedom battle is so controversial, you might be accused of engaging in politics. Joseph F. Smith, I'm going to re-quote that one, General Conference, 8, April 1946. There's been a tendency among some Latter-day Saints, even when the Constitution is mentioned, to say, there he goes talking politics. I am not talking politics. I am quoting the words of the Lord. Absolutely. So he well, no, that, that was before. Was Bretton Woods was before. 44. 44. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm a history teacher. Sorry. Yeah, good, good. Okay. <laughs> so that's what the devil says. The prophet says, those who support only, listen to this. This is his words. Those who support only the popular principles of the gospel, they have their reward. Next neutralizer. Wait until it's popular to do so. Or at least until everybody in the church agrees on what we should do. The prophet says, but this fight for freedom might never become popular in our day. And if you wait until everybody agrees in this church, you will be waiting through the second coming of the Lord. Would you have hesitated to follow the inspired counsel of the prophet Joseph Smith simply because some weak men disagreed with him? The next neutralizer, Satan says it might hurt your business or your family. And besides, why not let the Gentiles save the country? They aren't as busy as we are. The prophet says... Well, there were many businessmen who went along with Hitler because it supposedly helped their business. They lost everything. Many of us are here today because our forefathers loved. Truth enough that they fought at Valley Forge or crossed the plains in spite of the price it cost them or their families. We had better take our small pain now rather than our great, greater loss later. <clears throat> My ancestors on both sides across the plains of Brigham Young, lived in Nauvoo. The next neutralizer, Satan says, don't worry, the Lord will protect you. Besides, the world's so corrupt, heading toward destruction, there's nothing you can do to stop it, so why try? The prophet says, well, to begin with, the Lord will not protect us unless we do our part. But many of the prophecies referring to America's preservation are conditional. Again, I just want to reiterate, folks, these are the direct words from the prophet. These are not my words. This means, oh, that is, if we do our duty, we can be preserved. And if not, then we shall be destroyed. This means that a good deal of the responsibility lies with the priesthood of this church as to what happens to America and as to how much tragedy can be avoided if we do act now. That was in 1965. The next neutralizer, Satan says, don't do anything in the fight for freedom until the church sets up its own specific program to save the Constitution. The prophet says, this brings us back to the scripture I opened with today, those slothful servants who will not do anything until they are compelled in all things, maybe the Lord will never set up a specific church program for saving the Constitution. Uh, by the way, I'm going to add, because he said in another place, because it would split the church asunder if they did. The, another neutralizer, Satan says, just live the gospel. There's no need to get involved trying to save freedom in the Constitution. It's funny, we all know the uh, inconsistency. The prophet says, of course, this is dangerous reasoning because in reality you cannot fully live the gospel without working to save freedom and the Constitution. We would not say to someone, there's no need to be baptized. All you need to do is live the gospel. That would be ridiculous because baptism is a part of the gospel. All right, President Benson goes on, and this is in the 1987 General Conference, October. How do we preserve freedom? This, these are his words. First and foremost, we must be righteous. Our founders knew that. Washington said of all the dispositions and habits, which lead to political prosperity. Religion and morality are indispensable supports. That's from his farewell address. I've got, got that in the box. We'll talk about that more. 
John Adams said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Benjamin Franklin said, Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become more corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. The people knew freedom cannot exist. It cannot last without virtuous people. And here goes, here's more uh, Moroni in the Book of Mormon at the end. And whatsoever nation shall possess this land shall be free from bondage and from all other nations if they will but serve the God of this land who is Jesus Christ. Second, for President Benson, we must learn the principles of the Constitution in the tradition of of the founding fathers. <laughs> President Benson didn't say that. <laughs> but, I, but I think he would have. Third, we must become involved in civic affairs to see that we are properly <clears throat> represented. Involved. <clears throat> I'm, well, yeah, I am too. That means more than voting. Fourth, we must make our influence felt by our vote, our letters, our teaching, and our advice. <clears throat> So we, we must educate ourselves and spread the gospel. The, as, as Earl Taylor calls it, the gospel of liberty. I, I'm fortunate to teach with Earl and about 10 or 12 other instructors, and I travel this country coast to coast and teach seminars for the National Center for Constitutional Studies. We all do it as volunteers. <laughs> but we are richly paid. And <laughs> On Thursdays, we all we usually leave on Fridays. And on Thursday, Earl said, "Where are you going this week, Rick?" I'll tell him, you know, Austin, Texas, Alabama, California, Massachusetts, and he'll say, "Let's keep preaching that gospel of freedom." Anyway, that's Earl Taylor. DNC 134.1. We've already read it. Governments are instituted for the benefit of man, and he holds us accountable for our acts in relation to government. I might add, including our omissions, the things we fail to do. And I'm going to depart for just a second. I just think I should. Government can be used to protect and expand people's liberties and freedom or to destroy and restrict liberties and freedom. And if we ask our government or allow our government to do something that destroys others' freedom without Objecting, we are accountable. We are accountable. Works in the DNC 9810. 98 verse 10. Honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than this cometh of evil. You know, we ask, why do we have these people in office that do this stuff? We put them there. We put them there. President Vincent, Moroni knew that you cannot compromise with evil. This is uh, 1971, October. I'm going to continue. I'm going to repeat these two sentences. Moroni knew that you cannot compromise with evil. If you do, evil always wins. Patriarch Joseph F. Smith, April 1946 conference. If there be anyone who would destroy or weaken the Constitution of the United States, oppose him to the limit of your constitutional rights. <clears throat> the Bible says, you should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. This is me now, the Bible. But rather reprove them. Reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. Elder John A. Winslow, General Conference, 1944, <clears throat> April. The Gadiant robbers from the Book of Mormon are loose among us. The king men and women are running our government. And worst of all, we are blindly electing them or appointing them so they can continue to destroy the things we cherish most. We engage in the election the same as any other principle. You are to vote for good men, and if you do not do this, it is a sin. Hmm. To vote for wicked men would be a sin. Choose the good and refuse evil. Men of false principles have preyed upon us like wolves upon helpless lambs. 
damn the rod of tyranny. Let every man use his liberties according to the Constitution. So that was a long part of the fourth thing we can do. Care. Elder Ballard? Ballard. Okay, yeah. thank you. Isn't that amazing? Elder Ballard. <laughs> Quote, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have what's the conference date, but it's, it's in conference. Conspiring men and women, we need to raise our voices with other concerned citizens throughout the world in opposition to current trends. See, it's not just the old dead prophets that are talking about this, folks. I'm going to go back to that Ensign February 2006 article. What a sacred privilege and responsibility is ours to participate with other like-minded citizens to ensure that basic freedoms are preserved wherever we reside. The article's title is, I, the Lord, Make You Free. I, the Lord, Make You Free. Elder Shirley D. Christensen. Uh, Elder Boyd K. Packer on a, uh, in the Freedom Festival, July 4, 2009. Now, 12 wars later, and all that has gone on, that sun is now obscured. He was talking, I can guess, he was talking about Franklin's statement at the Constitutional Convention when he said, All through the convention, I have, I have seen the chair carved, uh, the sun carved on the president's chair. If you know that on the president's chair there was a sun halfway above the horizon on the back of his chair. Franklin said, I've watched that and I've wondered if it was a, if it was a rising or a setting sun. With tears in his eyes, he says, now I have the happiness to know it is a rising sun. Well, 12 wars later, the sun is now obscured. This is quoting from Albert Packer. We know that war can't destroy it, but if it is destroyed, it will be from within and now we face a danger greater than any of the wars we have faced to honor the Constitution and to honor freedom is a sacred duty for all of us. I invoke the blessing on you who are doing this sacred work that you will keep it up and that in due time the challenges that we face now from within can be conquered so that this nation may remain free. President Hinckley, 2006, June. Inside. That war, talking about the war in heaven, that war so bitter, so intense, has never ceased. It is the war between truth and error, between agency and compulsion, between the followers of Christ and those who have denied him. That war goes on. It is waged across the world over the issues of agency and compulsion. We are winning. We will continue to win if we will be faithful and true. We can do it. We must do it. President Thomas S. Monson, April 2008. As bearers of the priesthood, we've been placed on earth in troubled times. We live in a complex world with currents of conflict everywhere to be found. Political machinations ruin the stability of nations. Despots grasp for power. We, who have been ordained to the priesthood of God, can make a difference. President Benson, General Conference, 1961. The Lord has declared that before the second coming of Christ, it will be necessary to destroy the secret works of dark. For further study and action, well, we'll talk about that. I've got a whole lot of things. Well, that's the presentation. Is that powerful or what? 99% of everything that came out of my mouth is the words of the prophets. And I hope not to detract from anything they said. 